This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Okay, so um, I was asked, to, it was an, an interesting request that was made of me, which is to discuss the topics of this novel, which I hadn't read at the time. Um, Victoria asked me to discuss it in the light of the disciplinary issues in law um, around this kind of topic, which I basically took to be initially just filicide. But I think it's more than that. So I came to think that this novel is about m- mental health law, which is another interest of mine. So what I've tried to do is to just create some sort of response, which I had a a lot more sort of literary response, but I think that Jill has so admirably dealt with that that I won't be dealing too much with the actual text of the novel. I will try and just deal with the themes that I think that have arisen for me as a a lawyer and a mental health lawyer, as someone with a particular interest in, you know, particularly malfunctioning forms of maternity, for for want of a better word, a better phrase. Okay, so... As I was um, looking at this, I went back to an archive of um, articles I have about infanticide, including some which are quite obscure. And I found one written by a Nicole Burke, an Australian author, who I don't believe is actually um, an academic, but she wrote something very interesting. She said, It is necessary, psychologically, socially, ontologically, legally, and medically, for the woman to maintain herself as contained, restrained, obedient, and non-hysteric. In order for the skin of her femininity to maintain its status as boundary, as container, it cannot be breached. Certainly not from the inside. For the infanticidal mother, the death of the child is an attempt to render it never born. But in collapsing death and birth, she becomes Carly, the mother who is not mother, the woman who is not woman, the paradoxical woman, not woman, woman that culture requires her to be. She is a kind of Moebius strip of womanhood, the reversal and the actual, the horror and the sublime. Which I think said something to me very much about the effect certainly that Ormi's novel had on that was an effect both of horror and the sublimity of the, the literature, but also, I mean, to, to me, a, a, an intense horror, which actually, I'm not afraid to admit, caused me to cry for several hours. I found the, probably because my children are of an age and similar to the protagonist in Ormi's novel, I found it quite devastating. I have to say, to an extent that reading about cases of infanticide in legal terms have simply not been. And so I think that really calls to mind what I, I forget who it was said that literature brings us to an acknowledgement of situations which I, I think that legal reports, media reports simply don't do. And this is it's really reinforced my impression that we need to engage on a literary level with these, these tragedies, these issues, as well as on a, you know, a policy level. So what I've said. I will summarise some of what I said about the actual novel itself. Um, I felt that what was demanded here, not by not by Omi herself, but perhaps by a reading which emphasises responsibility, as a legal reading will do, is some sort of affirmation of the wrongness of these deaths. I felt that although we can see that this woman, that the, the protagonist, is suffering very deeply, and we have to acknowledge this suffering, what I felt, and again perhaps because of my own personal situation, was that what she did was utterly wrong, that lives were snuffed out, that we could see promise in. We could see the personality of these children. We could see that Stan in many ways was, you know, Stan walks away. He is trying to get away. She tries to fill him with her own subjectivity. Kevin is doing well at school, apparently. You know, he's the favourite of the teacher and you you get a sense of her jealousy of this. Mm -hmm. You know, so what we see of the children is so incredibly immediate that we cannot help but, I felt, be utterly horrified at this crime, and it is a crime. Here it is, the crime of filicide. Um, In the UK, the killing of a child over one year old. Uh, Infanticide is the term which I'll talk about later for the killing of a child under one year, which has a different different legal formulation applied to it here. And I think Olmi's novel forces us into this massive legal, medical, social and literary dilemma. How do we express compassion and support for someone who commits such an appalling act, regardless of the circumstances of that appalling act? And it's interesting that in law, that I think that there is, if you look at the way cases are treated in law, there is some limited recognition of this dilemma, of the subjectivity of the mother who kills. Um, if you look at the way judgments are made and also the media reports uh, parents who kill their children, particularly mothers, they are often treated as these vulnerable creatures whose crime is also their punishment. Quite often you will see comments like, you know, you have, you have done to yourself more than I can possibly do to you by sentencing you to life imprisonment. Um, I wanted to show you the picture of a Scottish, or she's not Scottish, she's California, but a woman who killed her children in Scotland, Teresa Rigi. Um, 
It's a particularly striking picture because it's a real shame I can't show it. She is absolutely perfectly turned out, flowing blonde hair, beautifully dressed, the children arranged around her. Uh, there are three children, they are arranged perfectly around her and a comment that is frequently made is, Teresa was such a good mother, her children were always immaculate. And you, <laughs> yeah, I understand the laughter, yeah. But it shows you the, the standards that women, that women and their children are held to, which are those of appearance, behavior, etc. And we see that, you know, what is concealed here, we are failing to deal with as a society. Obviously most, you know, most women, as Jill has already said, most women, even depressed women, even psychotic women, will not kill their children. But I feel that, you know, by the kind of, the surface assumptions that are made about motherhood are clearly not helping women in distress to tackle their distress. Um, crimes like Regis, and this doesn't really apply to Olmi, there are a number of increasing cases being reported, an increasing number, uh, which take place in the context of bitter divorces and disputes over child residence. Um, and I will go on to mention the rather limited form of mercy shown in legislation. These women are usually convicted of um, manslaughter under diminished responsibility. Um, it's a particular legal formulation you're probably aware of, which means that you, know, you basically have had an abnormality of mind, not necessarily a mental illness, but an abnormality of mind which has led you to perform an act which cannot be seen as intentional killing, which is the definition of murder. Okay. And we know that the very definition of mental illness itself is complex, especially where I think where you know, so-called women's issues are concerned. Um, when we have such overwhelming social problems, if you look at the, the study of women's depression, which I've looked at previously, I think that the pain and isolation, which is obviously frequently carried by mothers, not just by mothers, but I think we have evidence that mothers are more likely to be depressed, particularly when their children are toddlers, uh, than women of, a, of equivalent age. I think the expectation of pater maternal perfection, happiness, etc., is often pigeonholed as depression or anxiety, a simple medical problem. Okay. And I think that, unfortunately, this, these social distresses can become an illness with a definite physical symptomatology. It spirals beyond unhappiness. You develop lethargy, you become unable to engage with your, your work, perhaps, you know, the, the childcare that you need to perform. Um, but obviously the reasons for this are social and cultural as well as medical. And we need to maintain these three things in a complex. Um, and I think we have to include the reasons for filicide within this same kind of biopsychosocial biopsychosocial, that's a tongue twister, complex. Okay. Because I think that it's a mistake to describe filicide as unthinkable, because it's not, in fact, a particularly uncommon crime. Um, I, in 2009, there were 32 in England and Wales, 200 um, in the USA. They are actually split roughly half and half between fathers and mothers. I think the perception, perhaps particularly among feminists, certainly was for me, was that fathers commit more of these crimes, but they don't. It's roughly equally split. And that's in stark contrast to the overall homicide statistics, which show that 88% of homicides are committed by men. Okay. So. But, however, the conviction which follows is not usually one of murder, but, uh, unless it is a father who has done it. So there is that limited level of mercy shown to mothers who commit this, who commit this crime. And Teresa Riggi provides a very interesting example of this. Um, if you look her up on Google, you'll find lots of monster mum Teresa Riggi. She's now become the monster mum of Scotland. Um, but she received a sentence for culpable homicide that corresponds to manslaughter with diminished responsibility in the UK. Scottish sentence. Um, and always the stories are accompanied by these very evocative and disturbing images of her perfect family, um, the perfect mother surrounded by the perfect family. Okay. And you might think that you know, parallels with Olmi's very desperately poor, physically worn out mother may appear to be strained, but what drew me to this comparison was actually the legal language that the judge used to describe Ridgie's relationship to her children. Um, he talked about a deep and exclusive attachment which had become dangerously disturbed. Um, and this disturbed love was actually equated to a diminishment of responsibility and also I think was portrayed as being at the heart of um, these personality disorders which she was diagnosed with, which I'll, I'll talk about more later. Um, Lord Brackadale said, you who had a genuine but abnormal and possessive love of your children have lost them and are brought to this sorry pass. And he then carried on to talking about, you know, your responsibility is diminished but you are still responsible. These crimes are exceptionally wicked, etc., etc., and then he went into the usual kind of moral denunciation. But the moral denunciation was preceded by a very clear statement that, you know, we realise that something has gone wrong here for you. And her sentence was commuted, a, a very short um, commutation from uh, 18 to 16 years. So she still received a, a significant sentence. OK. 
And I think this makes us think about how, how we hold citizens who have caring responsibilities to account for these responsibilities when that goes completely wrong, given that we are an increasingly individualised society and increasingly privatised society. Um, state social care and support are being increasingly withdrawn. Uh, and you will all have noticed this increasing stigma directed against the irresponsible people who cannot or will not generate their own income. Um, particularly women who are single mothers, I think particularly the mentally ill as well as also the physically disabled, people who are seen to be failing to help themselves or as having made the wrong choices. Okay. Um, we've long also seen an increasing medicalisation of criminal responsibility. A lot of feminist theorists have looked at that. Um, and you get these sort of all these acts that are seen as beyond the rational pale, uh, particularly beyond the maternal pale, uh, will be obscured in catch-all diagnoses of anxiety, depression, psychosis, personality disorder. Okay. So in a certain sense, I think this terminology, this medical terminology, which is meant to make the offender readable, it's meant to make the offender understandable by law and psychiatry. In fact, I think it cuts off the possibilities for understanding of the acts that this person commits. Um, it reduces this person to a symptomatology and a set of risks. Um, I also think this has something to do with, you know, the general um, fear, the increasing stigma of mental illness. You, you remember, uh, do you remember the Blairite initiative about uh, dangerous personality disorders in which people were going to be summarily confined uh, to their homes? Uh, just not for having done anything, but simply for representing a risk of having done something. And I think that this is being applied across the board and applies particularly, particularly to parents, parental risk being such a big topic these days. Okay. And then you get this kind of imperative to, you know, therapy. There's this kind of forceful therapy which is applied to people who are malfunctioning. And this is thrown back at its target because in this climate, you know, in this neoliberal climate, if you don't help yourself, then there's even, you're an even worse subject. Okay. So in this climate, possibly, you know, mothers who are depressed might even welcome their own medicalization. It's, oh, I'm depressed. Well, that means there's nothing really wrong with me. I'm just ill. Um, it becomes a kind of possible mandate for care and support, which you might not receive in any other context. Okay. Um, but also you have to accept the label of defectiveness to get this help. And I was very interested to see Olmi's protagonist fighting that label. As Jill has said, you know, she says, I'm, I'm perfectly capable of taking my kids to the sea, thank you very much, I can travel at night, I'm not paralysed by my anxieties. And this keeps coming up, you know, that um, she's basically been labelled in many ways as a bad and defective mother, and not just by herself, you can see that other people have labelled her this way as well. Teachers, etc. Okay. Um, I think that this stands for me was very hard to. I felt so much for her having, in reading that. I thought, yeah, you know, good for you, stand up for yourself. And then you see, you know, the the increasing possessiveness. And um, I think that rather than emerging as a you know a simple good mother, um, in the end she seems to give way to these possessive impulses, which she disguises as altruistic. That was how I read it anyway. And. Um, I thought particularly interesting how, did you, do you remember the point at which she's panicking and dissociating and she says to Stan, will you fucking talk to me please, excuse my language, that is the language of the book, and she doesn't hear him, she literally can't hear him, his lips are moving but she can't hear him. And I think that that to me represented the gulf, and a gulf almost opens in the book because you, early in the book you see her, I think doing a lot of things that are really quite, you know, she calms Kevin down as they're going up the stairs, she gets him up six flights of stairs, this is a competent woman in many ways, is managing a great deal on her own. And as the book goes on, perhaps that seems to sort of slip away. And perhaps I saw that as a weakness of the book, perhaps. But, you know, that, can be, that is a place to be discussed. So what really interested me about this, this thing up the six floors is that they mentioned the law. And I immediately picked that out, obviously, being a lawyer. Um, those six floors, she says, were a punishment. It had to be done. All three of us had got the message there. I looked at my boys, sad, tired, and struggling. It was the law, that's what I thought. These stairs are the law. Fuck this life, where stairs are the law. And I thought, I found this fascinating. Now, she's on the wrong side of this law. She is, you know, like Kafka's sort of guy at the, at the gate. You know, so the gate is here, she's down there, and her sons are also there. And I wonder if the illegitimacy comes in there. These are illegitimate children. You know, and I wonder if perhaps she is feeling the stigma of that to some extent. These endless flights of stairs to climb represent the uncaring authority of this world that she hates. And I think we can speculate this includes this kind of poverty governance to which she's exposed. Social workers, teachers, you know, why aren't you getting to school on time? Why does he not have his lunch, etc. And law, of course, being this discipline dominated by expectations of rational, reasonable, beha reasonable behaviour would exclude a woman like her. It's bound to. It excludes all women, really. If you think about it, probably excludes all women, as Carol, Carol Smart has said. Um, 
feminists have argued that women are always denormalized in front of the law. They're always gendered. When you look at infanticide law, this is true perhaps more than anywhere. Uh, women come to law as gendered persons, and in infanticide law, they come both as gendered persons and as medicalized, pathologized persons. So um, what Nicole Burke says about this is that uh, society has, Western societies have been unable to reconcile the act of child murder with the misunderstanding of this fundamental nature of mother love that we have, that mothers could not possibly kill their children because they live for them. So therefore it turned to this medicalized theory in order to explain this irrational behavior. Okay. So, obviously, and this will all be familiar to you all, there's a general view that when a mother kills her infant, this is to do with postpartum mental illness. And uh, you'll see from the infanticide statutes in the UK, also Australia, Canada, various other countries, but not the USA, and it doesn't sound like France either. Um, you can see a limited, a limited amount of mercy in this. And uh, what the UK law says is that um, where a woman by any willful act or omission causes the death of her child aged less than a year, but at the time the balance of her mind was disturbed by reason of her not having fully recovered from the effect of giving birth to the child or by reason of the effect of lactation, the offence which would have amounted to murder is deemed to be infanticide and is dealt with and punished as if it were manslaughter. Um, and I'd previously written in a, a previous paper that I think this is a bit more than judicial chivalry or pathologization. It's sort of, you can hear in this a kind of hidden cultural awareness of postnatal difficulty, is the way I would put it. Because imperfect though it is, it's the only legal acknowledgement we have of the social and bodily difficulties of birth and child rearing. Uh, it, obviously essentializes them completely. For instance, that the lactation point is scientifically complete bunkum. I mean, there's absolutely no proof at all that lactation causes women to go mad. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, it's actually supposed to have a calming effect on the, on the body. Birth, a different thing. You know, obviously we do have um, if, occasions of psychosis. I mean, and I think this is something we can't get away from. So, you know, postnatal psychosis does appear to be, uh, there is something biologically going on there that we can't entirely put a finger on. We can't call that completely socially constructed. So there is a level of distress which is biological. Okay. Lactation is not part of it. So, but we have to admit, don't we, that you know, this relative lenience as basically assesses all women in the post-birth state as potentially psychologically disturbed in a volatile state which might lead them to lose control of their actions. Okay. And it's in this sort of suffocating context that almost anything a mother does in the postnatal period can be wrong. So psychiatrists can warn of the dangers of overly devoted mothering. Uh, devotion to the children, so some of them, is um, not likely to be a protective factor in terms of filicide. And high levels of emotional investment could put the children more at risk. This risk could be further escalated by the stress created by the pressure that women put on themselves to be good mothers. So we are not talking about women who are neglectful mothers. You know, the filicidal mother is frequently described as perfect and devoted. So, how much time have I got? I don't want to you run have over too much. About three minutes. Right. <laughs> We'll cut out a bit. All right. Yes, I just wanted to mention the role of the personality disorder here because I think it's very important. I think that um, law and psychiatry sort of step in as these disciplinary and also therapeutic guides for the malfunctioning citizens. So you get guides as to what your behaviour should be like and guides as to how you know you, it can be moderated when it goes wrong. And so you've got these hordes of syndromes that crowd into the, you know, the DSM. Uh, the Manual of um, Medical Disorders. Um, Teresa Rigi was diagnosed as suffering from three separate personality disorders. Narcissistic personality disorder, paranoid personality disorder, and histrionic personality disorder. And it's a question of how do these labels really help to decode the crime that she committed? And you start to wonder, well, I wonder what, you know, what would they have diagnosed all these protagonists with? Paranoia? <laughs> and, uh, it's just... And you start to see how there is a desperation to label and decode these women, which in the end does, does, no, does no good to anyone except the judge and possibly the psychiatrist who can tick a few boxes. So you can see how a language is imposed on these crimes which creates a great deal of paper, creates, probably creates a great deal of money for medications as well, but doesn't really create any, any support or any sort of, you know, root out of the problems that these women face at all. So... And I was going to talk about Andrea Yates, who um, was also convicted of a sort of, you, you all know the case in which she uh, killed her five children. Uh, she was under a sort of psychotic delusion, which interestingly was obviously based in her own Christian faith and the fact that she was deeply isolated, the fact that she was subjecting herself to discourses of perfection, etc. So I think we also need to look at how even psychosis and the states that we consider to be complete madness are connected somehow to that woman's life. 
There is rarely a psychosis which will come out of the blue and impose itself on a woman with no connection with her previous existence. And this is what um, uh, two, two important theorists, uh, Cheryl, uh, Cheryl Mayer, I did Cheryl Mayer. Do you know when you can't remember the first names? Oberman and Mayer, anyway, I can't remember their first names. Uh, the, uh, they're American theorists. They have written this book called Mothers Who Kill um, Interviews in Prison. And what they said, they came to a very disturbing conclusion. They said, these women are, 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 are us. Yeah, the, these women have not done anything that other women would not have done in the situations they were in. They are extreme examples of women in distressing situations. Okay. And they talk about it being, these women being separated from us because we cannot confront our own moral shrinking from these terrible acts. And I think a book like Beside the Sea, what's important about it to me is that it absolutely forces, to, forces us to confront the shrinking from these ghastly acts. This woman is definitely one of us, I think, who it was to me anyway. I didn't read her as separate from me. She didn't read as a, a complete mad woman. She reads as a protagonist like us who thinks like us, and that's part of I think, the clarity that you were talking about. It really brings that home, doesn't it? And also, I think, emphasises the role of literature in opening up I think these nuanced fields of, in, of emotional interpretation, which law, medicine, and the social sciences, I think, really have to learn from, because this is the only way they're going to avoid these traps of categorization, pathologization, and punishment, you know, for being in a certain category, for instance, which provide the methodology for this criminalization, medicalization complex that we've got. The last point, the point that I wanted to end on, is how do we advocate for women in these situations? Now, this is very much a kind of feminist legal question. We're always wanting to advocate for people. We always want to sort of stand up for, for the oppressed. But I think in this case, there is such an obvious oppression going on here, both of the children and the mother, if, that you end the book with the feeling that something, something should have been done. I mean, I certainly did. Something should have been done here. Someone should have been helped. And it's the mother, really, isn't it? Because in the end, she was the one whose suffering we focus on most of all, strangely, even though the children are the, the ones who die. So we wonder if, you know, we've, we feel that it's not enough to write off these murderous impulses to mental illness. Well, I certainly did when I ended the book. And I was thinking, you know, would the outcome have been different, theoretically, if this woman had received support, whether from a family, from friends, from the wider society? Would she have accepted this support due to her pride in coping until the point of breakdown, which I think she has, her possessiveness of her children, um, who are the only achievements and the true companions of her life, quite clearly. And so we end up thinking, in legal terms, whose responsibility is this event if it's not entirely hers? And we know it's not entirely hers. So we end up at this sort of limit point of social constructivism. Um, if women are being socially constructed to live out these ghastly tragedies, how do we intervene at a level where you know, intervention might actually work? And research institutions such as the NCI have produced some really detailed recommendations for improvements to social support and treatment access for mothers, uh, which would undoubtedly reduce the numbers of these tragedies. But we're in a time of austerity now. And my very strong feeling is that there's, no, there's a mandate now to privatise caring responsibilities even more. And my great fear is that um, we're going to witness an increase in these crimes um, in the coming decades. So. I, th I really think it's key at this point you know, to think about how we represent and advocate for women facing the very limited mercies of the psychiatric and legal system that they're going to be caught in.